Testing, testing. All right, good morning. All right, I need to let the kids out before I forget. While the kids are going out, uh, would you go ahead and open your Bibles up to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. If my memory serves correctly, this series that we're doing is going to go through the end of June, just so you have an idea. We're going to go through First and Second Thessalonians. And as we've been talking about these uh, books that Paul wrote to the believers in Thessalonica, have a very strong end, the, uh, end times focus. And that is something that is definitely always on our minds, right? We turn on the news, we see what's happening in the world, and it all seems bad, and it all seems like uh, we're getting close to the end, does it not? And so this is something that we study. The Thessalonian people were in the last days when it was written. It's about 2,000 years later. We are still in the last days now. There we go again. Hmm. Is that annoying? Manana. So in the last message, uh, if you recall, if you were here last week, we talked about Paul's ministry among the people of the town of Thessalonica, how it was very sacrificial, how it was very loving, and how it was like a parent to a child, always putting the needs of the child above yourself, right? And one point that I probably didn't do a great job of explaining, and somebody said to me after the service, I could do a better job of clarifying that, and I appreciated that input. When I talked about that sacrificial love that Paul had for the people, I said, you're not going to find that from within, and what I meant by that was the power of the flesh, right? But in a manner of speaking, you will find it within as believers because the Holy Spirit is inside of us once we, are, once we accept Christ, once we place our faith in Him. It says that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. And then the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. And that is the proper power source from find, uh, being able to serve people in this sacrificial way. So in a manner of speaking, you will find the power within, just not within yourself in the power of the flesh. You will find it in the power of God within you. So I just wanted to clarify that uh, just in case. I appreciate the person who pointed that out. Today we're turning topics slightly. So last week we talked about Paul's ministry and how that was towards the Thessalonian people. Today we're looking at the Thessalonian response. And we're going to look a lot at, we're going to take our time this morning, we're going to look a lot at the Word of God and how that plays into this. And I just want to point out here at the very beginning, we're talking about being in the last days, and how do you stay a faithful believer? We, uh, the name of the series, Exemplary Believers in the Last Days. How do you maintain that faithfulness to the Lord? The Bible says that things are going to get worse, increasingly worse as time goes on. So how do you stay faithful? We're going to find that it's going to come through the Word of God in your life, a grounding in the Word of God. So let's go ahead and open us up in some prayer, and then we'll get into it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning, and thank you so much for the songs that we've sung and for the messages that those had for us this morning. Uh, and thank you for those who are serving this morning, watching the kids so that uh, parents can be in here and studying. And so now we pray, Lord, that uh, you help us to be able to remove things from our minds that aren't in the here and now things uh, that would prevent us from being present in this moment and being able to be able to just listen to your word and allow it to sink into our, our hearts and minds. 
So help us now in that. Teach us your word through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm just going to read a few verses here. I don't know how far we're going to get this morning, admittedly. So I'm just going to read verses 13 through 16, and then we'll talk about those. We're really going to take our time on these this morning. All right, so verses 13 through 16. Paul writes, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last." So the first thing that we see here is that Paul thanks God constantly, constantly. And this word constantly, it's actually pretty rare in the New Testament. You don't find it in many places. Uh, three out of the four times that it's used in the New Testament are right here in 1 Thessalonians. So he opened up with saying that he's always thankful for them. In chapter 5, he's also going to say, pray without ceasing, if you've heard that verse. Pray without ceasing. That's the same word here, constantly. And so he's thanking God constantly here for the Thessalonian people and their response to his ministry that he had there among them. And just as a reminder that when you're in the last days and things are getting increasingly worse, there are plenty of things to focus on that are bad, right? Things that bother us, things that we wish were different. And this is a good reminder that thankfulness is really important in the life of a believer. Uh, Philippians uh, says to, if there's anything true, anything noble, anything right, anything pure, uh, think on these things, and the peace of God will uh, guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. So it's thinking about the things that God is still doing. Yes, things look like they're getting worse. Yes, there's evil running around, uh, things that are happening that should not be happening. And yet, God is still at work. He still has a plan. And if we look for it, we can see what he is still doing right in the here and now. And so when you focus your mind on that and look for what God is still up to, it does produce a thankfulness in your life. And so reminding that, yeah, things are bad, but at the same time, there is a lot going on that is good as well that we should focus on. And so Paul is saying, yeah, we had this, uh, the ministry didn't, go the way he exactly wanted it to in Thessalonica. If you remember, he was driven out of town in very short order, and yet there's still reason for thankfulness because the message when he got there, it had a profound effect on these people, and it actually bore fruit. So he's thanking God for that constantly. Okay, so as we go on here, it says we thank God constantly. Okay, what is he thankful for exactly? That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. And so here we see three things, heard, received, accepted. So heard, what does that imply? Well, it implies that somebody's speaking, right? That's the first step here of this process, that Paul actually had to go and speak. And it's like Romans 10, 13. If you could pull that up on the screen, you don't have to turn there. I'm trying to save you guys some turning. Um, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Right? And so somebody has to preach if somebody's going to hear. Right? That's step one. So Paul, he went and he was able to preach when he went to Thessalonica. And the people received the message. And so they allowed themselves to listen to what he had to say. We can do all sorts of things to try to be salt. Jesus talks about being salt, right? The seasoning on your message. You want to make it very tasteful. You want to make it very enticing, something that people want to listen to. I know when we were ministering with the Neva Clay people in Paraguay, uh, people would come into the village quite often uh, who were not Neva Clay people, right? They were uh, Mennonite ranchers often. 
And they would often be separate from the people. So they'd bring like their own lunch, for example. They'd bring a barbecue. They'd bring a grill, and they'd barbecue some meat, while, and they'd have their lunch separate. Whereas we missionaries, we would sit on the ground with the people and eat what they were eating. And I know that the Neva Clay, they said to us multiple times, like, we're willing to listen to what you guys have to say because you sit on the ground with us and you eat our food. You're not ashamed of us. And then they'd look over at these other people who are grilling their food over a separate from themselves, right? Uh, there are things that we can do to make the message more enticing, more something that wants to be received. People can be more receptive. Uh, but it is a choice that you have to receive or not receive, to listen or not listen to the message. Everyone has this choice. And the Thessalonian people, they made the choice that, yeah, when Paul got there, they were going to listen to this message. But listening is not the same as accepting. So he says here, you not only received it, you also accepted it, right? And so that is a thing that was a little bit different for us. Yeah, we could get the Neva Clay people to listen a little bit, but getting them to accept it as truth, getting them to accept it as God's word, that was a different challenge altogether. So accepting the message, this word uh, in the Greek, dekomai, literally to take with the hand, so grab it, hold on to it. And yeah, they re received this message and they accepted it. And why did they accept it? Why did they accept it? Because they didn't see it as a man message. They didn't see it as a human message. They saw it as what it really was, this pastor says, something from God, a divine message. This is actually a bedrock Christianity truth. This is something that everyone needs to understand about the Bible. This is not a human creation. This is not something that people came up with. This is something that God gave to us. When you think about it, God, he exists. If you've heard, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's everywhere. Why is he all of those things and we're not? Because he's outside of space and time. He transcends us. He's not like us. How do you get to know a transcendent being experientially out of your own head? How do you figure it out on your own? You can't. You can't. He does not exist in the space-time that we exist in. So how do you learn about God? He has to reveal himself. He has to communicate himself to us. If he does not take that initiative, we don't figure it out. But he has taken that initiative. God has spoken. Uh, the Thessalonian people recognize that when Paul was preaching to them, this isn't just a human message that he's bringing. He's bringing God's words. And that's what the Bible is. It is God's words to us. 2 Timothy 3.16. I know you know it, but we're going to read it anyway. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so we see that God's word is complete. It is something that can actually uh, equip you. It's like getting a tool box full of tools. Scripture is breathed out by God. This is something that is coming straight from his mouth. Just like your breath is coming out of your mouth, so too the Bible is coming directly from God's mouth to us through a human writer. Uh, but the human writer was merely just a, if you can picture like a megaphone, right? You hold a megaphone in front of your mouth. That's not the voice, right? It amplifies it. It's the way that it's the method of getting through. It has to go through the megaphone to the hearer, uh, but it's not the source. There are times that the human writers, God would be moving them to communicate certain things, write certain things down, and they wouldn't even understand what they were writing about. Daniel, uh, in this verse in Daniel on the next slide, Daniel is writing something down, and he's like, well, wait a minute. So he said, I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall, the outcome of these, uh, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time at the end. So he's like, I was, I was hearing all this, and I go to write it down, and I'm like, wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense. What does this mean? It's not for you, Daniel. 
don't worry. That's for a different time, a different people. You don't need to understand this, but you do need to write it down. Uh, I do want people to understand this someday, but it's not really for you. So this isn't Daniel figuring it out and communicating with us, right? These aren't Daniel's words. These are God's words. Daniel himself is a little bit confused, but God is using him to write it down. So the Bible is God's. It's sourced in God. It's not a human book. It's a divine book. Now think about this. I told you we're going to sit here and we're going to spend a little time thinking about this because this is a bedrock truth. We've got to think this through because it's of utmost importance. So if God has communicated with us, do you think it's important to understand what it says? Think about it. How many things does God have to do in a day? He's kind of important, right? He's kind of a big deal. And yet he's saying, you know what, I'm going to take time out here, and I'm actually going to communicate something with you that you could not figure out on your own. I'm going to tell you something that you need to know. It implies that he wants it to be understood. You don't communicate to somebody unless you want them to understand what you're saying. You don't waste their time. You don't waste your time. When you say something, you want to be understood. In the same way, God, when he communicates, he wants to be understood. So because of that, there is a right way and a wrong way to interpret Scripture. The Bible talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. How should we divide the word of truth? We talk about how we have a method of interpretation that is literal, right? We take it at face value. Now, sometimes there's poetic language, right? Sometimes you have to read a poem and you understand that it's poetic language, but you're still interpreting it literally. We interpret the Bible literally at face value. Doesn't everyone do it that way? They don't. Not everyone interprets the Bible literally. We do here at Gateway uh, because we believe that God communicates in a very normal sense. He knows he made us. He understands how we think. He understands how he communicates how we communicate, and so he's communicating with us in the most simplest way, and we should just take it at literal face value. So here's a wrong way. Let me contrast this. Here's a wrong way to interpret the Bible. This is called a moral interpretation. All right, if you can pull up the Epistle of Barnabas. Ever heard of the Epistle of Barnabas? It's not in your Bibles. <laughs> okay, it's not part of the Bible. Uh, in the epistle of Barnabas, the whoever wrote it, we, it's not in the Bible because it wasn't written by Barnabas, one. It was way later. It's a, uh, not a book of authority here, okay? I don't want you guys going out and saying, I need to study the epistle of Barnabas today. Um, but this was a way to interpret, this is a way that some people interpret Scripture. So it says, uh, I'm going to have to read it up here. It's too small in the back there. Is there then not a command of God that we should not eat these things. So he's referring back to the dietary laws in Deuteronomy. He says there is, but Moses spoke with a spiritual reference. For this reason he named the swine, as much as to say, thou shalt not join thyself to men who resemble swine. For when they live in pleasure, they forget their Lord. But when they come to want, they acknowledge the Lord. And in like manner, the swine, when it is eaten, does not recognize its master. But when hungry, it cries out, and on receiving food is quiet again. And so whoever wrote this book of Barnabas, he's saying, you know, the dietary laws of the Old Testament, it's not really about don't eat these things. It's really about saying uh, there's certain qualities about the pig that are bad, and so you really shouldn't be that way as a human. So that's really what the interpretation is. Can you see the problem of why we don't interpret Scripture this way? It puts us as the authority trying to figure out this hidden layer of meaning somewhere below the text. And whoever uh, comes up with an idea, who's to say it's right or wrong, right? Because I'm the authority, and I'm my own, yeah, I'm the own, my own king of interpretation, and there's nothing that you can do to say that I'm right or wrong, because who's to say? So we don't uh, hold to this moral interpretation of Scripture. There's also an allegorical method. If you've ever heard this allegorical method, this is a early church leader. His name was Hippolytus, around 200 A.D. Okay, now what Hippolytus is trying to do, he's trying to prove that the second coming of Christ was going to be in the year 500. Okay? He's trying to prove, he's, he's in 200, so he's saying 300 years in the future is going to be the second coming of Christ. 
He says, how will you prove to me that the Savior was born in the year 5500? So why does he want this? Well, he believes that each day of creation is a thousand years, like a day represents a thousand years, and there's going to be seven days of human history. So the millennial kingdom has to start in the year 6000. So to prove that the second coming of Christ is 500 years after Christ, it has to be the year 5500 by God's timing. Does this make sense? It's very complicated. He has to prove that Jesus was born in 5500 by God's calendar. He says, learn that easily, O man, for the thing, easily, he says. Uh, the things that took place of old in the wilderness under Moses in the case of the tabernacle were constituted types and emblems of spiritual mysteries in order that when the truth came in Christ in these last days, you might be able to perceive that these things were fulfilled. For he says to him, and you shall make the ark of imperishable wood, and you shall overlay it with pure gold within and without. You shall make the length of it two cubits and a half, and the breadth thereof one cubit and a half, and a cubit and a half the height, which measures when summed up together make five cubits and a half, so that the 5,500 years might be signified thereby. So the measurements of the ark, like it's not really about the measurements of the ark. It's really about saying that Jesus was going to come in the year 5,500 by God's calendar, and then the millennial kingdom has to start in 6,000 because each day is 1,000 years, and so there he goes. Uh, you can see the problems with this method of interpretation. For one, uh, it's the year 2024 now, so he is off by about 1,500 years at least. Yeah. We interpret the Bible literally. We say, look at it, read it, and see what it says on its face value. Now, sometimes there are times when God was speaking to people in a different time, in a different context. We need to understand what that situation was at that time so that we can understand what God was saying to them so that we can try to then grasp, okay, well, what does that mean for us here and now in a different time, in a different context? Absolutely. Absolutely but still taking it very at the face value, literal, and uh, the historical method. So why did I just say all that? Can we connect it back? Because God has spoken to us. This is from God. He's going to do, and you can take that by faith, and you can step out into a situation that looks impossible because God has spoken. So that's the point of David and Goliath. The point that David says, I can trust God here because he's already said he's going to drive him out and he's cursing the name of God. But we, we drift into allegory. We drift into this metaphorical, uh, allegorical interpretation when we try to apply it to us. But we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we're not making ourselves the authority of Bible interpretation and that we're taking it literally for what it says. Otherwise, we can come up with all sorts of things. All right, so... God has communicated with us, and it is so important. And it says here in verse 13 still, we're still in verse 13, that you accept it is what it really is, the Word of God, and it's at work in you believers. The Bible says that the Word of God is living and active. It is living and active. This isn't something that is just a mental exercise. We come to this like we would come to any other textbook in a college class and just learn the material. No, we're actually interacting with a living God through a living word. And when we receive it, like the Thessalonians did, when we accept it as God's word, we allow it to go in deep. Now, all of a sudden, it's active. It's working in our lives. It's doing this through various, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is in us. He's teaching us. He's recalling it to our minds as we are going through the circumstances of life. Yeah. It needs to be properly understood if it's going to have that active work in our lives. But that is what's happening when we accept it as God's word, when we are really allowing it to take hold. It is at work in us. Now, how was it at work with these Thessalonian people specifically? It says, For you, brothers, verse 14, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things for your own countrymen, from your own countrymen, as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind. 
Uh, so if you remember when we had our first message of the, the Thessalonian series, we talked about how when he went to the city of Thessalonica, he wasn't there very long. And next thing you know, it says that it got some men of the rabble, right? They rile up this crowd of people and they go to the house where Paul and his companions were staying. They're intending to have them arrested. They're intending to have them thrown into prison like they were in uh, the city of Philippi. They don't find them. They drag Jason. This is a local guy, a local believer. They drag him. They attack his house. They drag him to the court. And so right from the get-go, these Thessalonian people are having opposition. They're suffering persecution. And they drive Paul out of town, these people. These people are so intent of shutting down Paul's message that they follow him to the next town and run him out of that town. Okay, so what do you think it's like for the people who are still in Thessalonica? Do you think it calms down after Paul leaves? We can deduce that it does not, that it was still quite a volatile situation in the city of Thessalonica. So they're suffering things from their own countrymen. It says, you became imitators of the church in Judea. So if you remember that, back in uh, Acts 8, I believe, it's the young church there in the city of Jerusalem, in the region of Judea. Paul is actually one of the primary persecutors at that time. They're uh, arresting them. They're stoning them. They're putting them in prison. People are losing their lives in Jerusalem from their own, from their fellow, you know, neighbors, not Christians, not believers, uh, but from their former friends and neighbors. They're the ones doing the, these things to them. In the same way, Thessalonica, the people are now suffering and uh, are having this, uh, this trial. It reminds me of the parable of the sower. You guys remember the parable of the sower with Jesus in Matthew 13? He says a guy went out and he sowed seed, and some fell on the path, some fell on the rocky soil, some fell on good soil. And he explains what that parable means, but he specifically talks about the rocky soil. And what is the rocky soil? It springs, the seed springs up fast, and then it says, but when persecution comes, the plant withers because it has no depth right? It has no soil depth. It's on rocky soil. And the reason that that reminds me of this passage is because it's the same situation. The Thessalonian people here are now receiving this persecution. The hard times are coming, and they're not withering. They're standing tall. This isn't in rocky soil here. This is nice soil. They're, the word has gone down deep into nice soil, and it's getting them through this hard time. And so exemplary believers in the last days, we will face opposition in the last days. You and I will face opposition. Do you want to stand firm in your faith? You've got to allow the word of God to take that deeper root in your life. If it's on shallow roots, it's going to wither when the opposition comes. We have to prioritize it on a daily basis. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 on the screen. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. From bad to worse. That's a different one. Confused me for a second. Uh, yeah, from bad to worse. Things will go from bad to worse in these last days. And uh, if you want to live a godly life, you will suffer. That's what it says. You will be persecuted. So it's important to have the word of God deeply, deep, allowing it to just take that deep root within our lives. Okay. Um, what else does he mention here? He says, uh, you suffered the same things from your countrymen as they did from the Jews. So he's talking about the people in Judea, the city of Jerusalem. These are Jews, Jewish people, Israelites. They're suffering from the Jews. It reminds me of the parable of the tenants, okay? Because it says here, kill both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. So if you remember the parable of the tenants, there was a guy who owned a vineyard, and he leased it out to some tenants, and after he had gone away for a time, he 
sent some servants back to the vineyard tenants to get his share, get his, yeah, get his payment for having let them use the vineyard. And it says that the servants, they beat, they killed, they stoned. He sends more servants. They beat them, they kill them, they stone them. And then he says, you know what, I'm going to send my son. They'll respect my son. And when they see the son, they say, there's the heir. We kill him, the vineyard's ours. And so they kill the son. It's very similar to what he's talking about here. It says in the Gospels, it said that the Pharisees perceived that Jesus was talking about them. <laughs> yeah, you think? Glad you picked up on that. Uh, yeah, the Jews, they killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets. And they drove us out, Paul says. They drove us out. So we talked about they drove Paul out of Thessalonica. They go down to Berea, the next town. Paul gets there. The people are studying the word. And the next thing you know, here the people from Thessalonica show up. You know, we're running you out of this town too. Uh, yeah, they, they drove them out. They displease God. Yeah, displease God. Yeah, we have a free will that God, God is sovereign, but in his sovereignty, he allows us to make choices, both good and bad. Some displease him. Yep. They displease God and they oppose all mankind. Oppose all mankind. Yeah, put that verse from Matthew 23 up there. Yeah, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. So it's not just enough that the Pharisees weren't willing to accept Christ themselves. Like, they had to go beyond that and say, I'm going to keep you from accepting him too. Like, it's not just for me. I'm going to prevent you as well. And Jesus calls that out. And it's the same thing here with what these people are doing in, in Paul's life. It's like, not only do we reject your message, we run you out of town, we run you out of the next town. We don't want anyone to hear this. So they're displeasing God. They're opposing all mankind. We will face opposition when we live for Christ. It says, so to fill up the measure of their sins. And uh, this is kind of an interesting teaching it's found in other places in the Bible as well. If you recall, God made a covenant with Abraham, right? God made a covenant with Abraham. He says, I'm going to give you and your descendants this land, this land right here, the land of Canaan. But first, they're going to be slaves in another nation for 400 years because the sins of the Amorites are not yet complete, is what it says. So, the Amorites were the people who inhabited that land, and they're on a bad trajectory. God already knows how this is going to end, but he's letting it play out in the course of human history. He doesn't stop it short. He allows things to play their full course, and that's how he does it with many, many, many things. I know that sometimes we can get discouraged because we see a situation that doesn't look good, and we wonder why... God doesn't intervene right here, right now. Why doesn't he put a stop to it right here, right now? He sees the bigger picture. He understands things that we don't understand. There are greater purposes at, at work and at play that we have to be able to trust him in the moment by moment. Say, all right, I know that this thing does not please God, but he's letting this play out right now because something else is in focus for him. He's allowing this to happen because there's a greater good that he uh, has in mind. He's also very patient. He's also very, very patient. That's uh, in Peter. It talks about why hasn't God come back yet. He's not slow in fulfilling his promise as you would consider slowness, but he's uh, patient with you, not willing for any to perish. So he's giving more and more time so that more people can accept him in the here and now. So he lets things play out sometimes. Here we see that, uh, so always to fill up the measure of their sins, he's letting the Jewish people reject him uh, and as they are right here. He's letting that play out. It says, wrath has come upon them at last. And this is a hard one to interpret, what exactly Paul is meaning here. We see in chapter 1, he says, the wrath to come, right? So it's a future wrath that we talked about in chapter 1. This sounds like it's something that's here and now. Uh, the wrath has come. 
right? So not wrath to come, wrath has come upon them. I've gone back and forth on this, and the, the scholars debate back and forth as well. We know in Romans 11 it talks about how God has hardened Israel. There's a partial hardening. In theological circles, they call that judicial hardening. Uh, there's some hardening of the Jewish people right now. It could be talking about that. Um, it could also be talking about Matthew 23, uh, Matthew 23 is basically Jesus' judgment against the nation of Israel, saying, you have rejected me. He's already gone into the city in the triumphal entry. He's already gone in. They've rejected him as the king. He hasn't been crucified yet, but they've clearly rejected him, and so he's pronouncing the judgment. So it could be that the city was destroyed in 70 A.D. That could be what it's talking about. Or it could be talking about the, the partial hardening. Either way, what can we say about it? Uh, we know that God is not done with Israel. He's not done with Israel. He has promises to Israel that he will keep. He will never not fulfill his promises because God is truth, right? Romans 9 through 11 is your passage there if you want to look into that deeper. God has not rejected the nation of Israel, but he has set them aside for a period of time. We're in the church age. This whole time period is called a mystery in Scripture. It's something that uh, was not known about in the Old Testament. And it came about after the Jewish people rejected. Now, all of a sudden, we're grafted in, the Bible says. The Gentiles are now grafted in. We have this privileged position where the Holy Spirit indwells us. And we have this entire age that we are reaching the world. Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. Now we are also, the church is a light to the nations with the Holy Spirit uh, indwelling us, leading us, and taking the message of God throughout the whole world. It's a pretty neat thing. We could keep going, but I think we're going to start wrapping it up right here. And we'll save the other verses for next week. I want the point of the message today to be understood uh, quite clearly. We've talked about basically two things. We've talked about how in the last days there are trials and persecutions. The fire is hot in the last days. We will be tried. It will not be easy. And it'll probably get harder as time goes on. It'll probably get harder. That is the clear teaching of the Bible, is that things get worse before the end, not better. And so, because of that, opposition that we're going to face, the persecution we're going to face as believers, as people who are wanting to live their life according to God's standards, uh, we are going to face that opposition. And the, the reality is, if you're not grounding yourself in God's word, you're not going to be able to stand up in the trial. Coming on Sunday morning is a good thing. And I try to teach the word as best I can. But it's not all-inclusive. I can't teach you everything on a Sunday morning. Uh, we can have a Wednesday night study as well. It's not going to happen. It needs to be part of your daily walk as a believer, grounding yourself in the Word of God. You have to be doing this on your own as well, spending that time in the Word, spending time in prayer, saying, yeah, God, I've, I've taken in this Word. I've received it. I accept it as your Word, but I need you now to continue to uh, be active in my life through this, allowing it to produce that work in me. It's going to take time. It takes uh, some revelation. It, you find out things about yourself. Now you have to respond. Then he shows you some more, and then you respond again. It's a whole process. It's not a, I got it, and that's it. It's part of your daily walk, and it will be until the day that we die. But you've got to allow those roots of God's Word to just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into that good soil. Because, yeah, your faithfulness depends on it. It really does. We don't have the strength in our flesh to be able to withstand. But through the power of the Holy Spirit and through God's Word, He has given us everything that we need, right? We have all things that we need for life and godliness is what uh, the Scriptures teach. We have it but we have to use it. We have to be taking advantage of it. So that is what Paul is thankful about in this passage. This is how the Thessalonians received this message. 
They allowed it to sink in deep, and they did stand up in the trials that they faced. So that's why Paul is very thankful for that, and that's really the, the point of these verses here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you so much for your word that gives us everything that we need. God, we admit that there are plenty of things that we don't understand in your word. And, Lord, uh, we also recognize that you're willing to teach us. You're willing to teach us everything that is in, uh, in the word. You want us to understand these things. That's why you told us what's... Uh, you told us what you did. You left out the things that we don't need, and you told us the things that we do need. And so we thank you for that. We pray that we continue to respond to you in our lives so that we can continue.